is the latter rain. I mean, we're up here in Seattle, and we get a lot of rain throughout the year, and now it's starting to get, you know, sunny and warm. It's been sunny and warm. Who's missing the rain? <laughs> right? It's almost like, where is that cool rain to cool us off and wet the ground? And uh, you can see grasses starting to, you know, turn brown a little bit because of the... But rain does an amazing thing when it comes down from the sky and it hits the ground and it nourishes and it gives nourishment to the plants and, and and they show because they grow faster the yard grows the grass grows you have to mow it you know two times a week instead of once a month sort of thing but rain brings nourishment and and it's an amazing aspect in the farming community about rain there's typically two times of rain that they really need in the farming community and one is called the the former rain which is in the beginning when you when you toil the ground you you, you break it up and get it prepared <clears throat> you plow it you lay the rows and you plant the seeds and typically there's a rain that comes down and really saturates the ground now it's not as though for a 24-hour period it just comes and dumps down but over a period of weeks there's rain that come and keeps the ground moist so that the seed can take root and it can uh, start to germinate and grow and then there's a time in between after the first little season of rain <clears throat> that it'll rain periodically but you've got a you've got a um uh, irrigate and then sort of towards the end and ready, getting ready for harvest, there's the latter rain. Now, this is just in the farming community. The latter rain that comes and really puts a lot of um, moisture or rain on the ground so that the last little bit of growth in the plants, that they can really get ready and prepared, and then you harvest. And so it's very important in the communities of the former rain, of the farming communities of the former rain and the latter rain. And the scriptures talk about that. The Bible talks about the the former rain and the latter rain. And and as we know in the scriptures, in the Bible, there's analogies given. And analogies to where the people could understand and they could relate. And so when the prophets of old or in the New Testament were talking about the former rain and the latter rain, they would understand that they're talking about in farming, it's important to have a bountiful harvest. It's very important. And so when they're talking about the former rain and the latter rain, and then making it a spiritual aspect, we know that on the day of Pentecost, throughout the scriptures, it talked about Jesus coming, the Messiah coming to bring the Spirit so that the Spirit could be given to mankind. And we know that as Jesus came to the earth and he walked as a man and he did miraculous things, incredible things, so that the people were amazed. And they said, no man has talked or spoken or done these things before. This is truly of God. And then when then the, the religious leaders of the day or the people of the day crucified him, God raised him the third day. And Jesus said, now, go and wait in Jerusalem for the promises unto you, and you shall receive the latter. This is the former reign where you're going to receive the Spirit, and you're going to be given power. You're going to be able to do miraculous things. This is the former reign. And so as we look in the Scriptures, we're going to kind of look into the aspect of the former reign and the latter reign spiritually as well. So let's Let's start in, uh, turn to Deuteronomy, if you would. And as we're turning to Deuteronomy, I'm just going to uh, um, Deuteronomy chapter 11. But I'm going to talk a little bit about what's been happening recently in the newspaper. There's been articles written over the last few years in the newspaper about Pentecostals. Pentecostalism, Pentecostal churches, and talking about how Pentecostal churches are on the rise. The the experience of Pentecostalism, and that encompasses a lot of things, right? It encompasses in the mind of um, um, Christians or so-called Christians, right? Um, religious people or spiritual people. Pentecostal, they... They sum that up with, with healings, with miracles, with speaking in tongues, with outrageous stuff like literally taking up the snakes in Mark 16, which is not what Jesus wants us to do. 
But Pentecostalism in a whole or uh, spiritual miraculous things is on the rise. And uh, let me see, there was um, got a couple of, of things here and it says um, over a quarter of uh, the world or Christians are, or religious people over a quarter are Pentecostals or identify as Pentecostals up from only 6%. So let me see, there's what? Six billion people in the world, so a quarter of that, a billion people or so in the world now um, relate as Pentecostals, rather than in the 1980s, early 1980, it was only six percent, which would be what six percent of a billion or six billion is, I don't know, a few hundred thousand or or a few million maybe, but a billion, over a billion people now, it's on the rise. The future is Pentecostal, the fastest growing religious movement on earth. One article said Pentecostalism. Ukraine's Pentecostal churches are growing tremendously. Maybe because of the bombings, who knows, and Russia coming in. But that's the key, right? When there's conflict in the world, where do people turn? People turn to maybe God has the answer. Man certainly doesn't because they want to fight each other. But Pentecostal renewal sweeps the planted, the planted, the planet. <clears throat> I, I tell you, I, I, I see the effects of working so many hours these days and working hard because I left this morning, left my phone at home. But uh, hey, I don't need it. I haven't used it. No one's called. <laughs> well, I don't know if anybody's called, but but I'm still here rejoicing, not having one less thing to worry about, right? My phone going off. Um, but uh, in the early 1900s, there was a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So when the day of Pentecost came and the Holy Spirit was given, people received the Holy Spirit and others were standing around going, what's going on? Peter and John got up or Peter got up with the, the 120 and said, look, this is what Joel talked about, the Spirit being given to mankind. And there was such a great outpouring on that day, 3,000 people received the Holy Spirit. And just right after that, another 5,000 people. And there was a great outpouring as people went out. That's what we can see as the former reign, spiritually, as the former reign. And that's kind of what we're looking at today. But then there was a time in between. That went on for a few hundred years, and there was a great outpouring, but there was great persecution as well. We know that the uh, Caesars and the, the kings and the rulers of that time, even the religious leaders of that time, it was so different. They said, we don't want this. And they would, they would kill the apostles or the disciples or those that were of the way, as it was known back then. They would put them to death trying to stop it. And then over the years, there was a um, well, until the early 1900s, there was a lot of darkness to where the religious leaders of the day said, you know what, this, these spiritual writings are too much for normal people. You've got to come to the priests where we can interpret and talk about God's word. So it wasn't open to everybody like it is today, where you can just go down to the uh, 7-Eleven or the... the, uh, the the gas station and, and buy a Bible almost. I mean, it's that readily available. But in the early 1900s, it started happening again. Azusa Street started down in, uh, in L.A. There was a great outpouring where people, for whatever reason, there's not really known why, but there was a great outpouring. So much so that people were speaking in tongues in the church and just excited about, without any real guidance or wisdom as to what they were doing, they were praying in tongues because it was so exciting and it was so powerful. They would be praying in tongues in the church and people walking by on the street were going, what's that noise? I'm interested. And they would start speaking in tongues and then they would go into the church. I mean, it was an incredible time of outpouring of the Spirit without any really direction or wisdom. But since then, even in uh, 1960, there was a great upheaval. There was a, an Episcopalian, Episcopalian minister who got up in, in front of his huge congregation and said, I've had this experience of speaking in tongues. And they were like, what? Oh, no. And it was just such a shock. That was radical. They couldn't handle that. And it was, it was, uh, it was an amazing time. But so we're in the latter reign. So let's uh, look in Deuteronomy. Let's start here. Deuteronomy chapter 11. Let's start in verse 13. 
And this is God talking to Moses and speaking, and he says, And it shall come to pass, if you shall hearken diligently unto my commandments, which I command you this day, to love the Lord your God, and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. So there's a requirement. People must come to the Lord and say, yes, I want to follow you. I want a new life. I want a different life. I want to serve you with all my heart and soul. I want to love you. I want what you have to give. If you're willing to follow my ways, he says in verse 14, that I will give you the rain of your land in his due season, the first rain and the latter rain, that thou mayest gather in thy corn and wine and thine oil. And so this God is saying that if you'll follow me, if you'll come to me, if you'll listen to my words and my directions and, and my guidance, and if you'll follow those things, I will bless you abundantly so that you will have abundance with the rain. And the people of the day understood and they knew. As we know where the children of Israel were in Egypt, and then they came out of Egypt being delivered and walked around the desert, they would have understood the, the importance of the rain because it was a dry land and it was harsh. And it needed that nourishment to grow crops. And so as in this scripture here, the wine and the oil, they're representatives of the spirit in the New Testament. Wine and the oil are sort of identified as the Holy Spirit. And so there's a little spiritual connotation here, even back then, where he says, you follow me, I will bring the rains, the former and the latter, and you shall truly be abundant. But it's to obey. In Acts chapter 8, let's go to Acts chapter 8, please. Acts chapter 8 and verse 14. Very similar concept after the Holy Spirit had been given in Acts chapter 2, where they received the Holy Spirit, the spoken tongues. Tongues came on them as, as like fire sat upon each of them. That's when Peter got up and said, repent, get baptized, and God will give you the Holy Spirit. That's when the 3,000 were added to the church that day. But here in Acts chapter 8, a, little, a few chapters on from receiving, verse 14, Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John. So they heard the word of God. Somebody was down preaching. Philip was down preaching to uh, Samaria. I should say up. Jerusalem is down here and Samaria is up there. And so when Philip had gone up and preached the word of God in Samaria, people there were like, wow, this is pretty amazing. This is powerful. Yes, we want to follow. We want to obey. And so that's when Peter and uh, John came down in verse 15, who when they were come down, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. And so once they received the word of God, once they were willing to obey the word of God, these people in Samaria, Peter and John came down and prayed for them so that they could receive the Holy Ghost because the land was dry. It was spiritually dry at that point. And when the word was given, they soaked up. That nourishment, that rain, that former rain, the beginnings, the seed was being planted. The rain was coming down. They were soaking up that nourishment. And we know that they went on to receive the Holy Spirit because they received the word with gladness and they obeyed. And because they obeyed, God gave them the Holy Spirit. As we read in his word, that's what he does. Hosea. Let's go back to Hosea. In chapter 6. Now Hosea is after, um, after the book of Daniel. Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea. Hosea, Hosea in chapter 6. And up to this point, the children of Israel... And as, as we read through the scriptures in the Old Testament, we can see where they, would, the, they, the children of Israel, would say, yes, we want to hear God's word. And they would follow the direction of the prophets. And as they followed the direction of the prophets, there was great blessing. And as there was great blessing and abundance, they grew. 
And as they grew and, and they, were, they were fat and happy, in a sense, right? Then they started to get a little lazy and lax and start to look to the right and to the left. And they got off track. Time and time again in the Old Testament, we see that happen. And this is a point where they had gotten off track. The children of Israel had gotten off track. And Hosea the prophet comes back to them and says, look, you've been off track, but wait, there's more. In verse 1, Hosea chapter 6, verse 1, Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn and he will heal us. He has smitten and he will bind us up. So as we read here, it says, he has torn, but he will heal us. It's not that God came in and said, okay, you've been blessed enough. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tear it apart. I'm going to separate you from the blessings. It's because when people are following the ways of the Lord, God blesses abundantly. And when you get off that track and you start looking to your own path, there's no blessings of the Lord out in your own path. And when you're walking your own path for a while, you feel like, wow, I'm a, I'm a little cold and it's dark out here and it's lonely and I'm not feeling blessed and I need something different. And so Hosea says, come back and I will heal. In verse 2, after two days will he revive us. In the third day he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. And as we know, this is a very similar um, analogy or direction to the New Testament where Jesus came. And he brought the words of truth and of life. He brought that living water, the Holy Spirit, to be given. And what did they do? They crucified him. And for three days, he was in the grave. And then on the third day, God raised him up. And when God raised him up on that third day, it was complete. The resurrection was complete. The restoration was complete because Jesus came and fulfilled the Old Testament completely. He fulfilled that law. And God said, yes, my son, you have walked after my statutes. You have completed that which I asked you to do. Now, with your sacrifice we can restore the rest of mankind because now we can give them the Holy Spirit, that strength. We can pour down that rain so they can flourish, that spiritual rain so they can flourish. As we know, the Scriptures talk about a year is with the, the Lord, um, sorry, a day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. So if you can look at that aspect of two days or 2,000 years. And then the third day, Jesus is resurrected. The 2,000 years is the former reign and the latter reign. From the time that Jesus came until just about now, the end of the latter reign. When he comes back and calls his people up to meet him, what happens on that third day, that 3,000th 3, 3, year? We're ruling and reigning with Christ. There's nothing but blessing. There's nothing but benefits. There's nothing but glory because evil is removed and far from us. Satan has been bound for that thousand years and the influence of sin is gone. And we'll be here ruling and reigning with Christ and how powerful that will be the thousandth year, the third day where he says uh, that we shall live in his sight, in verse 3, then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord, his going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and the former rain upon the earth. So spiritually we can see this 3,000 year period, this time of 2,000 years of restoration. And then the third, of being living and reigning with Christ. And so the abundance of rain, the abundance of nourishment, the, 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 the rain that comes, again, how vital it is in the farming community to have that. Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 5. Jeremiah chapter 5. 
in verse 23. It's amazing to see how the Lord is willing and constantly looking to draw us back to Him. And there's this time now. And some may ask, well, why is it that there was such a long period of, um, it seemed like no one was receiving the Spirit, or there wasn't much receiving the Spirit between the former reign and the latter reign? And it's because of mankind not wanting to turn and follow God, but they turn and follow their own way. They want to do things in their own strength. They want to do things in their own way. And so they were taking religion and saying, let's keep it within ourselves. And now we'll just give this to the people so that they'll follow our ways. Or we'll persecute those that are seeing miracles and signs. Because the enemy of this world is the prince of this world at the moment. Because the key is God is waiting for people to follow him, to seek him. And when God sees people willing and wanting to follow him, he blesses abundantly. Where are we at? Jeremiah chapter 5 in verse 23. But this people has a revolting and a rebellious heart. They are revolted and gone. And when people turn away, and maybe yesterday when you were out preaching the gospel, when you were out handing out pamphlets, when you were out talking to people saying, there is a better way, God wants to bring the latter rain on you. He wants to nourish you and give you this Holy Spirit so you can abundantly grow. People say, no thanks, not interested. I don't want to hear that. That is just not for me. Good for you. Glad it's working for you, but not for me. They don't understand what they're missing. But this is what Jeremiah is saying. There are people that are revolting and rebellious in their heart. In verse 24, Neither say they in their heart, Let us now fear the Lord our God, that giveth rain, both the former and the latter, in his season. He reserveth unto us the appointed weeks, of the harvest. Your iniquities have turned away these things, and your sins have withholden good things from you. Mankind's direction, what does the scripture say? A, man, uh, a man's ways seem right in his own eyes. This is what I'm going to do. Yeah, this is what I want to do. That's, I've even had people, when talking about the things of the Lord, I've had people say, I'll stand up before God. I'll present my case. I'm justified. And I'm thinking, oh, man, you've got, you've got no chance. Jesus came down and gave his life for you. And for me, so that we could have this. And you think you're going to stand up and say that your justification is better than Jesus' sacrifice? Your justification? And there are people out there that say yes. In their own ways and in their own minds, they're thinking, I'm okay. I'll stand up. They don't understand that God is a, is a, a, a fearful God, but he's a loving God. He says, if you come and you follow and you do it my way, Many blessings, much abundance, I'll take care of you. But if you want to do it your own way, you're outside the blessings. And I'm sorry, there's not much good that's going to go on there. Uh, Proverbs chapter 16. In Proverbs chapter 16. One of the amazing things is we've read in, in the scriptures is um, the story of Elijah and the King Ahab. And Elijah came to Ahab and said, look, you've done the wrong thing. You're an evil king. Turn to the Lord. And Ahab said, no, no, buddy, I'm the king. I'm doing it right. You're doing it wrong. And Elijah said, okay, God says no rain for three and a half years. No rain for three and a half years. He could have said, the armies of the Assyrians are going to come down and conquer you. 
He could have said, you're going to have a pestilence and it's going to affect you. He could, he could have said many, Elijah, God could have said many different things. But he, he said, no rain. And know, Ahab, that it's because your decision not to follow God is why the people are going to suffer as well as you, because he's going to withhold the rain the former rain and the latter rain. So you can imagine as a farmer what you might have thought. I'm going to plant crops, and for three and a half years, there's not going to be any rain. How am I going to water them? How am I going to grow? How are things going to be ready when it comes harvest? But Elijah said, no, Ahab, you're doing the wrong thing. And for three and a half years, it didn't rain. And God said, well, maybe, maybe King Ahab has learned his lesson by now. Elijah, go and gather the prophets of Baal together and let's show them. And we know the story, right, where they met on Mount Carmel and the prophets of Baal, 450 of them were there. And they called out to their God, nothing happened. Elijah called out and fire from heaven came down and consumed the sacrifice. And then what did Elijah say to his servant? Let's go and pray for rain. God said, it's going to rain. Let's go pray for rain. And they went up to the mountain and they prayed. And he said, go and check, see if you see any clouds. No clouds. Oh, I prayed again. Let's have some more prayer. No clouds. Prayed again. Six times they prayed. The servant went, said, sorry, boss. Clear skies, man. It's sunny and warm in the forecast. Oh, no, come on, Lord. You said you would. The diligence of Elijah. I know my God will deliver on his word. The seventh time, the servant came back and said, you know, I see a little tiny cloud up there. I mean, it's just a little guy up there. And Elijah said, oh, man, we got to get out of here. It's going to pour down rain. And they got out of there, and the rain came down and just saturated the ground. But that's the rain and how important it is as the Spirit is so important in our lives and in other people's lives. And as we can tell them, you're living in a drought. You're living without the Spirit. Once you receive the Spirit that God has to give the Holy Spirit, there's an amazing blessing. There's amazing benefits. There's amazing peace that comes with the challenges of dry ground. Where are we at? Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 15. Verse 15, In the light of the king's countenance is life. And his favor is as a cloud of the latter rain. When the king is happy, there is blessings. There is much rain. His countenance is abundance. Our king is Jesus. And when we're following him and his ways, he is, his countenance upon us is light and abundance of rain. Plenty of nourishment to get us through the dry times. Plenty of nourishment. He's there for us. In the light of the king's countenance is life. How amazing and how powerful is that? Hosea. Let's go to Hosea chapter 10. Hosea is, uh, let me see. That is, again, wait, where we were, did I say Hosea? Yeah, we were already in six. That's right. We've already been to Hosea. Let's go back. Hosea chapter 10 this time. And so we're going to read now just a little bit further on from where Hosea was saying, let's turn to the Lord. Let's get, let's turn back to the Lord and see that rain, see the abundance come to us. He's saying here in chapter 10, Hosea chapter 10 and verse 12, sow to yourselves in righteousness. If we're doing the will of God, if we're filled with God's Holy Spirit, and when we're following after the footsteps of, of Jesus, actually we heard that in the, in the gifts today, follow his footsteps and there is much blessing. As we're following in his footsteps, there is much mercy because we're living in this life torn We've got the flesh, we've got the natural man that wants to do it his way. 
And we've got the Spirit. We've received that Holy Spirit. And the Spirit says, follow the footsteps of, of the King, of that sacrifice, of the Son of God. And when we follow the footsteps in the Son of God, there is blessings. And when we turn, even now, filled with the Holy Spirit, and that natural man says, no, come this way, kind of reminds me of being pulled sometimes. Freya, this morning, I was having a conversation out with Craig, and we were talking, and we were having a conversation, and Freya comes up, Papa, Papa, come, come on, get the balloon. She said, because she remembered the balloon was here, right, the green. I said, no, I don't think the balloon's here. It's gone. No, no, come, come. She grabbed my hand. She says, come on, Papa. I'm like, no, no, look, I'm, I'm talking with Craig. She's like, no, no, come on. I got to get the balloon. Okay, so she's pulling me, right? And, I'm, and so, sure enough, there was the balloon. We got the balloon. She was happy, and I went back to the conversation. But that's how sometimes the natural man is with us, pulling us one side, pulling us the other side. Sometimes it's the spiritual man pulling us this way. Follow the footsteps. Don't go that way anymore. Come on, follow after the king. It's challenging. But right here in verse 12, sow to yourselves in righteousness and reap in mercy. Even when we stumble and fall, falling after the footsteps, following the footsteps of our king, we make a wrong decision. We stumble and fall. We get off the path a little bit. There is mercy there when we get up and say, where are those footsteps? Let's follow again. Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. That's what God wants is to rain righteousness upon us. He wants us to be blessed. He wants us to be abundantly nourished in his word so we can flourish for him. Joel, Joel chapter 2. Boy, time's flying. Joel chapter 2. Joel's just the next book on from Hosea. Verse 23. Joel chapter 2, verse 20. See, this is Joel speaking, one of the prophets of the Old Testament. And he says here, Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. Rejoice. Be glad. God is wanting to bless you abundantly. And as he's talking about this, what does that mean? He wants us to be ready for the harvest. He wants things to grow and be abundant. And if we go down just a few verses in verse 26, he says, And you shall eat in plenty, be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord. You, uh, praise the name of the Lord your God that has dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never be ashamed and you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am your Lord your God and none else and my people shall never be ashamed and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And here Joel goes on to says, I will give you the former rain and the latter rain. I will give you that abundance and I will pour out my spirit. So the direct connection between the spirit being given and the rain that comes down, the former rain and the latter rain. It is just a powerful, powerful thing. James, let's go to the New Testament. A couple more scriptures. James chapter 5. James chapter 5 and verse 7. This is James speaking, and he's, he's talking to those that have received the Holy Spirit. This is a, a, a letter of encouragement and direction and, and, uh, and hope, and just keep following that same path. In James chapter 5 and verse 7, he says, Be patient, therefore, brethren. Unto the coming of the Lord, behold, the husbandman, the farmer, is waiting for the precious fruit of the earth and has long patience for it until he received the early and the latter rain. We're in the latter rain right now. 
We are in the latter rain, the Spirit being poured out. You can see in the news, not only is it saying over the last couple of years, Pentecostalism is, is increasing exponentially. But we can also see that there's wars and rumors of wars and, and conflict. And that there's coming that last battle, which is time. It's the time for the harvest. Let's finish up in Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, from verse 1. This is Jesus speaking. This is a time where he's been walking along with his disciples, and he's given them power, and he says, I give you power to go and tread on the serpents. I give you this power so you can know, and you can, have, you can see what it's like when people rejoice and they're healed, and they're raised up. I need, I need servants. I need people to go into the harvest. In verse 1 of chapter 10, Luke, he says, After these things the Lord appointed other seventy also, and sent them out two by two before his face, going and preaching the gospel like we did yesterday, planting the seed before his face into every city and place where he himself would come. He's sending us out first to plant the seed so he can come along and give the Holy Spirit to those that ask. Because he says in verse 2, Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. And we are those laborers planting the seed, reaping, seeing the harvest come when it gets here, that the Lord comes back and gathers his own, seeing those being filled with the Holy Spirit, growing up and producing fruit, showing the fruit in their lives so that as we see the fruit in even our own. And so that's what we're looking at, the former rain and the latter rain. And the beginning, the day of Pentecost, there was a great number that received. Now in the middle, there was not much happening. Now at the end, the latter rain. I mean, we just look at Papua New Guinea. We look at South America in Brazil. We look at in Ukraine, even in China, in some of the places where it's forbidden to speak of God in the Bible. People are receiving the Holy Spirit. We may not see an abundant growth here, but we might see an abundant growth. We don't know. It's not our job to know. It's our job to plant the seed. Because the rain is life. The rain brings food for the harvest. And the Spirit is life and brings closeness and righteousness with God. All the people said, Amen. We'll finish there.